I think there was a time I never thought this was going to happen. Uh, it was, it's been three years since we last brought folks together at Convene. And um, how many of you have been to an analyst conference in the last three years? Anyone? Oh, you have? Ah, so there has been one going on. Good, good. Well, thank you very much for coming. I know COVID tests and all this other stuff, it's going to be very tiresome. And, but we got here, right? And we're healthy. So that's the main thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about everything that we once knew um, is now under assault. So uh, how many of you here feeling a little burned out after a pandemic and three years of this stuff? Everybody's feeling, including myself. And I think it's not just because we've been staring at a video screen for the last, uh, you know, the last kind of three years. We've been going through all sorts of things, an assault on our very stability. So I'm going to talk about what's changed. I'm going to talk about winning um, a talent war. That's going to steal the market. I'm going to talk about uh, services. There's a lot of services people here, people either using services, selling services, working with service providers, how services must evolve from providing effort to actually providing performance. And then we'll have a fantastic leadership panel to uh, follow through. So this is why we're burned out. <laughs> so we spoke to 602 executives. This is brand new data. We've only just got it in. And uh, we spoke to senior executives in the Global 2000. And we've asked them, you know, what's adversely impacting their organizational goals? And here you can see big three things. Cybersecurity, big, big issue for everybody. Inflation, supply chain, changing consumer expectations. You know, if you're, uh, if you're in a bank, fees are dead now. You know, no limits, no overdraft charges anymore. You've got to figure out how to make some actual dollars in retail. If you're in the healthcare business, you've got to figure out... Um, you know, my patients like seeing doctors virtually now. That, that was never available before. And also mental health is no longer a taboo topic. A lot of people are needing help with mental health issues that they're not embarrassed to talk about in these day and age. And other things like the Great Resignation, there's still some impact from pandemic, and obviously geopolitical conflict. And then we're all worried about potential recession. I'd like to say there isn't going to be a recession, but if I told you that, I'd be lying. Um, Anyone who thinks they know what's going to be happening in the next year or two is talking nonsense uh, because this is unraveling in front of us and we have to figure this out. A lot of economists and a lot of people think if we can tackle inflation, everything else will eventually get resolved. But that's the biggest um, problem we have right now is making sure you know, we've got 18% inflation in the UK. It's not as bad in the US uh, and it's going to be bad in Europe. So we need to really work on this. Um, so those are the big macro problems. What about the uh, uh, enterprise um, agendas? So when we look at what's important to companies today, um, these are the big three things. It's security, privacy. It's accelerating digital modernization. It's becoming a digital organization. Um, and then ESG, environmental sustainability and governance, comes in as the third most important thing that leadership are thinking about today. And at the bottom, surprisingly, is reducing staff attrition and training developing staff. So what we've done is we then asked the same enterprises, um, you know, what initiatives have you got underway to meet these strategic priorities? And I think there's a two to three year lag between importance of agenda and actual execution against, against this. And you can see here, um, the number one issue um, on the uh, strategic priority side, where the money's going right now, is actually improving automation and um, leveraging emerging technologies to do that. Um, what's also interesting here is, uh, while people talk a big game with ESG, it's actually not the number three investment area. So people want to do a lot about ESG, but they're not actually in practice investing much uh, compared to other areas. And then the other area, you know, okay, we got a problem with staff attrition. That's becoming increasingly high on the issue area for enterprises to deal with. Let's think about it. Automation is the number one priority for organizations right now in terms of investment. 
But what we found in incredible, we spoke to 500 automation leaders across the global 2000, and 70% of them actually see themselves as beginners still. You know, they're typically focused on RPA, and they're just trying to get initiatives um, out of the uh, individual business units. They're trying to actually do a lot more with that. Um, so we're right at the beginning. We are still right at the beginning of this scale. We, we, we introduced RPA 10 years ago to the industry, and it's only now that it's become the number one area in, in broader automation, and companies are investing in it. So what are the major internal challenges for companies to meet their strategic directives? And the number one challenge is, is quite clearly hiring quality staff. So it's not the number one um, headache. It's becoming a big headache. But in terms of actually um, meeting these internal challenges to meet strategic objectives, it's hiring quality staff, which is the number one issue. Then it's a lack of centralized data, quality data. And then it's retaining quality staff. So the more we get into the problems facing companies, the more we get into these issues, it's coming down to one thing, it's people. And I believe that who wins the war for talent is going to steal their market. This is that critical, is what we're seeing going on right now. So we commissioned this study, and it's only just become available where we spoke with 1,800 employees of top tech services business services companies globally. And we've asked them, are you going to be with your current employer for the next, uh, you know, for the next 12 months? And here is the data to show that this is a pretty concerning situation, right? So we've cut the data by the main countries that we survey. This is 1,800 employees. And you can see here, 7 out of 10 are actively looking to leave their current employer. Um, a few are not looking out, but may take a job if one comes along. Barely a third in countries like India, UK, are actually prepared to stay with their current employer. So seven out of 10 people are looking to leave in the next year. And we wonder why there's attrition rates at 30, 40, 50% in businesses. Here's the data right here. In terms of who's looking to leave, you can see um, the gray bar shows, well, a lot of the Gen Xs and boomers. Um, they're the ones less likely to leave. Um, the ones most likely to leave are the, um, uh, are the younger folks. They're uh, looking out, they're thinking about what they want. You know, there's a, there's a whole different vibe going on in the work culture. So let's look at what is really going on here. I think employees feel under-challenged, right? So a large number here would like to feel more challenged in their current role, so they're bored. Uh, a large number uh, would accept a job with a competitor. Uh, for a 30% salary increase, regardless of the company. So they're fearless to move. Um, a lot of them would say it'd be difficult to find a job as good as this one. Very few people think that that's going to be a problem for them. So they're not very loyal either. But the one positive note is they're passionate about IT business services, and they can see the difference they can make to their clients. So despite the lack of loyalty, despite the boredom, despite the the fearlessness to move, they can actually see tremendous potential. They want to do more. So they can see that their clients need real help. They can see more interesting work that they can do. They just want to do it. So while it's a, it's a fairly morbid scene in terms of retaining talent, if you can give them the, the exciting work to do, there's a good chance they'll stick around. We're going to talk a lot about this over the next couple of days. And I'd like us to come to some conclusions because everybody's coming up with their own views on remote work at home. I think we just had Michael Dell came out yesterday with, everyone can just do what they want. Our employees, if they want to come to the office, great. If they don't, they, they don't. And that's what he said. His company is probably different from others, right? But India leaves the desire to work remotely. They, uh, they love it. They've got the culture for it. Um, they've really taken to working remotely. Um, and that's a problem when you're sometimes delivering five to 25 billion dollars of services revenue a year and you're all these people working from home. How do you train them? What do you do? So what's the difference between the age ranges here? Um, you can see that when we ask them what, you know, which of the following describes your dream employer, all the 18 to 25 year olds, they want to go and work for startups. So what happens when the startups have run out of cash, right? And uh, where are they going to go next? And then the older folks, a lot of the people maybe in this room, 
they want to start their own companies. <laughs> they think, hey, I could, my, my skills are in demand. I can just go out and put my own shingle out there and make a very decent living and doing my own thing. And in fact, I don't need to earn quite as much money as I was before because I'm not commuting anymore and I've got a good handle on my, on my financial affairs. And this one even, this one blew my mind a bit, is that women are even more uh, into going into the office than men. Men want to work remotely more than women do. You can see here the uh, terms of preferring to remain at home. Yep. And in terms of um, would they leave if they were mandated to go into the office, more men would leave than women. Yep. It's uh, quite, quite a big margin as well. Love to know why. We had this discussion and we were trying to avoid stereotypes. Is it, is it women are more sociable? Do they like to dress up and go out more? <laughs> but they want to go to the office. They want to, they're probably fed up being stuck at home. But anyway. So here, here's some, maybe, maybe some hope for the future. So we asked, the, we asked the 1,800 employees, would they consider leaving their employer if they uh, were mandated to come into the office three days or more a week? And you can see here, fairly good chunk, 50 to 60% um, have already said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider leaving. But when we ask those people, um, you know, would you uh, start making plans immediately to leave or would you take your time to evaluate options, you can actually see here um, only one in six staff are actually saying, overall, I'm going to dust off my CV and look for a job immediately. So there is a bit, if you want to get staff back into the office, even on a three-day-a-week model, uh, a good chunk of them aren't going to run straight away. And so there is time to figure out, OK, we bring people back. We've got a bit of time to make it worth their while. Make this an environment they want to come back to. So it's not as desperate as we sometimes think. You know, there's just going to be a huge uh, outflow of talent. And then finally, we asked them about recession. Um, and uh, is, it, is it changing your thinking about whether you want to stay in your current job? And you can see here, India, less concerned. Economy's doing well. Um, there's a good buzz in the employment markets there. So the, less, the smallest number in India are worried about a recession. US and UK and Western Europe, yes, there's a, you know, closer to 60% are worried about a recession impacting their job. Are you more inclined to jump ship in a recession? Most, most of them are not. Um, they've actually said, we'll probably slow it down except people in the US. They're actually more inclined to leave their current employer in a recession. So something about American mindset might just be, hey, my company's going down. I'm going to get the hell out of here, go to somewhere more successful. So I'd like to play uh, some thoughts of somebody uh, I've, I've admired very much over the years. And let's hear what he has to say. One of the keys to Apple is Apple's an incredibly collaborative company. and. So, you know how many committees we have at Apple? No. Zero. We have no committees. No committees. We are, a very, we are organized like a startup. One person's in charge of iPhone OS software. One person's in charge of Mac hardware. One person's in charge of iPhone hardware engineering. Another person's in charge of worldwide marketing. Another person's in charge of operations. It's, we're organized like a startup. We're the biggest startup on the planet. And we all meet for three hours once a week, and we talk about everything we're doing, the whole business. And there's tremendous teamwork at the top of the company, which filters down to tremendous teamwork throughout the company. And teamwork is dependent on trusting the other folks to come through with their part without watching them all the time but trusting that they're going to come through with their parts. And that's what we do really well. And we're great at figuring out how to divide things up into these great teams that we have and all work on the same thing, touch bases frequently, and bring it all together into a product. We do that really well. And so what I do all day is meet with teams of people and work on ideas and solve problems to make new products, to make new marketing programs, whatever it is. And are people willing to tell you you're wrong? 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, other than snarky journalists. I mean, people that oh, work Oh, yeah. No, we have wonderful arguments. And do you win them all? Or? Oh, no, I wish I did. <laughs> oh, see, you can't. If you want to hire great people and have them stay working for you, you have to let them make a lot of decisions, and you have to, you have to be run by ideas, not hierarchy. The best ideas have to win. So, Otherwise, good people don't stay. But you must be more than a facilitator who runs meetings. You obviously contribute your own ideas. I contribute ideas, sure. Well, I, why would I be there if I didn't? <laughs> Steve Jobs built one of the most successful businesses in history, and uh, he gets his leadership team in once a week, and they go through everything. They talk about everything. They flatten out the company. They have a startup mindset, and um, their teamwork is about trusting their teams under them. But he does it. They were doing it one day a week. He was in every day talking to everybody else, but he would bring his team in once a week and they would just thrash everything out. And I think that's a, that's a good thing to come away with, with saying, at least find somewhere to start. And if you meet your team every week and you have that time to really go through everything going on in your company, you can make a lot of progress. Um, so we're thinking about how do we rethink hierarchies and leadership roles. And we've done a lot of thinking about this at HFS. We have a lot of conversations with our council, our one council, um, to understand the changing role of a CEO. That's about having a more long-term mindset. You know, it's about um, driving change, driving the culture, creating that mindset which you heard Jobs talking about, which is he wants a, he wants a non-hierarchical attitude and mindset and one of innovation. And then we talk a bit about the need for partnering in an ecosystem more than ever. So there's been a lot of talk about having someone like a chief partner, office, partner experience officer who looks at cross-industry partners, who looks at the hyperscalers who are increasingly powerful and important in relationships, uh, and service providers as well. How do we make these relationships blossom beyond effort to actual purpose and mission? Um, everyone loves this concept of a chief transformation officer, and I've had this discussion with some CIOs, some COOs about, and CFOs about bringing together IT and business operations more effectively. Um, having common policies across data and decisions and cyber, having a uh, common focus around enabling tech, bringing together the technology minds and the business minds under one leader in the organization. The chief customer experience officer, one of the hardest roles in the business is how do you bring analog and digital together to modernize a business? How do you truly understand wallet share growth and mind share? Designing your customer experience but also designing your employee experience. I had a CEO tell me the other day that he has a harder time selling his own value proposition to his own staff than he does his clients. And that's why, I mean, I've even known people take on this chief ex um, employee experience role uh, coming from CX roles, coming from other roles in the organization. This role is so important, right? Um, you know, we've been denigrating HR for many years, but this is a greater form of taking employee knowledge and skills and empathy out of the HR department into a managerial role. Middle management today has never been more important. They are such important people to have energy, empathy. They're the ones to take the message from the senior team and drive it through the teams. If people aren't showing up to work, if there's low engagement at work, fix your management first, then worry about the employees. But if you don't fix your management teams, you're never gonna get where you wanna get. So the final piece is how do services um, as an industry really shift from you know, where we came from? And you can see here over the last you know, 20 years of 30 years of services and outsourcing and offshoring, digital. Um, it took us to where we got to in 2020. I actually think between 2010 and 2020, they were great, we call them pontification years. Like we had great discussions about what was possible without actually really acting against it. And then pandemic hit and it forced us to sometimes make real changes in process for the first time ever. Like how do we, how do we operate in a virtual remote work at home environment? We've actually got to change process. We've actually got to figure out the data we need to be successful and design process to get to that data. How do we do that? So I think that took us into the one office. Um, and I mean, some businesses were running the same processes since the second world war. I mean. When we look at the reality of the last 
few decades, it's pretty much doing the same stuff the same way, just a little faster, a little cheaper, moving data around the company a bit more effectively. Uh, but now we're looking at this, uh, we call it a one ecosystem. It's an ecosystem world now where we're finding partners with common goals and common purposes, and we're trying to figure out how to operate in this unstructured ecosystem. How do we be more effective? How do we take things to the next level? So we, we spoke a lot about the one office, especially in the, the last, I think the last summit we did was the theme was one office, and uh, everyone is very enamored with how do we link CX and EX together? How do we align our employees around our customer experiences, right? You know, the technology that we spent billions of dollars trying to delight our customers, we're now spending on our staff so they can actually use, you know, smart um, conferencing and, and whiteboarding techniques. And, you know, if you're working in a hybrid work environment now, you need, you need cool tech to get people working effectively, right? Otherwise, if you're just giving them Zoom and saying, do video calls, you're just a work-at-home employee. So add to that the partner experience when we get to the one ecosystem. So this is really finding um, companies with um, common purpose, common goals um, across the value chain, right? So you were trying to deliver vaccines uh, in, the, in the pandemic and you're an IT services provider, you could actually, one, provide great data for those providers of vaccines. You can also service the regulators, the Fed, all sorts of, all sorts of other um, areas across the value chain, we'll be hearing a lot more about this, to actually get deeper into the customer, customer life cycle. How do you become an ecosystem player? How do you work with competitors and partners who have common goals and common purposes? And we're seeing partnerships really happen now in our industry that we wouldn't have dreamt of seeing even four or five years ago. So we talk about this in an innovation framework, um, and Saurabh Gupta will tell you a lot more about this, but um, the first horizon is the one we're in right now, and it's called digital. This is about eradicating technical debt. It's about getting our cloud right, our cyber right, getting automation working, building an automation mindset within the business, becoming efficient, becoming effective. Um, where we're going is one office we've spoke about. This is eradicating process and people debt. This is about instilling a growth mindset in your people and your customers and your environment. Uh, making sure your talent is fluent with technology. Um, you've got a real understanding of cloud and edge and all these, and AI and these types of things. And then finally, we go to that one ecosystem, which is about finding those common areas of goals. It's about having the ability to monetize data as an asset for your business. It's about having more creative talent. It's about having industry clouds, which pull together companies across industry and verticals, which are effective for them. And then we're seeing the onset of Web3, which is a decentralization of the internet and this metaverse, which, you know, it's way more than putting on those nice goggles and walking around the place. This is, this is an immersive experience for how we buy things, how we meet people, how we do things in the future, how we have meetings at work. There's a lot of stuff going on, but this one ecosystem is really where we're all trying to shift things. And you can see here from the study that we did with our 600, our Pulse study, Enterprises, you know, 63% um, are in Horizon 1 today. They self-identify with the fact that, um, you know, they're functional with digital transformation. This is where we are. Digital is the starting point for where we're going. Um, phase two, about a third of businesses feel that they're getting into that um, Horizon 2 enterprise transformation mindset. They're getting into the one office. And then a small amount of feeling that they're at that ecosystem play already but a third think they're going to be there in two years. So these are the horizons we're on, and we're making that shift towards an ecosystem where we're truly connected with other companies. We share common goals and purposes. We work together with other businesses to be effective. And, you know, we talk about effort. When we look at relationships today with, um, you know, our clients and our service providers, so much went into just paying for time and materials and effort. And this is a failed relationship beyond maybe four or five years, because if you're just buying effort, at some point you want that same effort for less, and you might not want that business anymore. So how do you get more into a performance-based relationship where you're starting to get towards outcomes and gain sharing and these types of things? And then we get to this purpose-built relationship where I don't think many of us are yet, 
but we've got to get away from just delivering effort for clients. We've got to get into delivering outcomes. How do we get the client mindset away from, well, I want my 200 FTEs. How do I know you're delivering that value to me? Well, maybe you start with your 200 FTEs, but after four or five years, you should be able to figure out how to take that effort you're delivering and saying, what's important to your business? You know how much we have to pay to deliver this for you. So start paying us for outcomes. Start paying us for performance. So let's hear one more time from our, our dear departed friend. I mean, you guys, most of you have come from companies where you've had work experience, right? How many of you are from manufacturing companies? Oh, excellent. Where, where are the rest of you from? <laughs> so how many from consulting? Oh, that's bad. <laughs> you should do something. No, seriously, I, I, I don't think there's anything inherently evil in consulting. I think that... <laughs> I think that without, without owning something uh, over an extended period of time, like a few years, where one has a chance to take responsibility for one's recommendations, where one has to see one's recommendations through all action stages and accumulate scar tissue for the mistakes and pick oneself up off the ground and dust oneself off, uh, one learns a fraction uh, of what one can, what you're, you're coming in and making recommendations and not owning the results, not owning the implementation, um, I think is is uh, a fraction of the of the value and a fraction of the opportunity to learn and get better. And so, what what you you do get a broad cut at companies, but it's very thin. It's like a picture of a I would I could use. I'm a vegetarian, so I won't use steak, but it's like a picture of a, of a banana. Uh, it, you might get a very accurate picture, but it's only two-dimensional. And without the experience of actually doing it, you never get three-dimensional. So you might have a lot of pictures on your walls. You can show it off to your friends. You can say, look, I've worked in bananas. I've worked in peaches. I've worked in grapes. But you never really taste it. And, and I think that, that um, that's, that's what I think. Mm. Uh, you're also a variable expense, and in hard times, you find yourself. <laughs> Sorry. Not too many cult consultants in here, so we just, we'll pick on Cliff, right? <laughs> um, but I think he said one thing that really did resonate, um, which was uh, without owning something over an extended period of time, like a few years, where one has a chance to take responsibility for one's recommendations, where one has to see one's recommendations through all action stages, accumulate scar tissue for one's mistakes, and pick oneself off the ground and dust oneself off, one only learns a fraction of what one can. So I think if you're embedded in your clients for years and years and years, you have such an amazing opportunity to take those relationships to a different level. Um, you know, this is a fairly dated view of consulting from, from jobs, but I thought it was quite funny to say, if you're just going in and out of clients, how much are you really doing beyond giving them some advice, beyond actually getting in there and getting your hands dirty? And I think that's a, it's very encouraging for, for the industry. Um, one of my staff did say, why are you showing Steve Jobs? You do realize that guy drove his employees absolutely insane. And I said, well, he's my role model. <laughs> Good. So um, I'd like to now move to our group discussion. And um, I'm going to invite to the stage some, some terrific people who I've handpicked uh, because of their backgrounds and voices. So maybe, uh, Cliff, as we picked on you, you can be first up. Cliff Justice is the... Um, in innovation leader for KPMG US. Yep. Take a seat, Cliff. Thank you. So we have a good friend of mine, Nitin uh, Rakesh, who's the CEO of um, one of the fastest growing uh, IT services providers, Emphasis. Um, I think he's more than doubled the size of the business in seven, eight years. Um, we have Mary Lasty from <laughs> the uh, Walton Professor of Information Systems and Director of the Blockchain Center of Excellence for the University of Arkansas. One of the hardest to remember job titles. 
keep changing, so don't worry. Uh, Tiger from Genpact. Needs very little introduction from me, but um, probably one of the one of the big inventors of modern day business services, uh, having been part of Genpact pretty much since its, its inception. Um, and then we have is Milan now here? He said he'd arrived. Milan Rao. Uh, Former GE executive, healthcare specialist, went to Wipro to one uh, many lead operations there, and now is a president at Smart Energy Water, a very exciting SaaS business. And I'm assured uh, we do have Tracy from EY. She's going to be here in five minutes, apparently. She tried to get in last night. Flight got cancelled. Flight got cancelled this morning, but she's. So I think we'll we'll sneak her in when she when she shows up. Great. So without further ado, let's. Uh, Oh, by the way, I forgot to announce, if anyone is still tweeting and stuff, there's a hashtag. So, <laughs> HFS Super Summit. I don't think anyone does Twitter anymore, right? But <laughs> and any bots, right, exactly. You can go on LinkedIn and do something, or just, just go on there anyway and, and send some pictures and stuff. We used to do Chatham House rules, uh, but that, that went out the window with social media. So. Um. <laughs> Great. So, um, how much did, did this pandemic change everything? So, Tiger, would you like to start us off? You've got to start with me. Yeah, <laughs> always. So, so, Phil, first of all, like, you, know, you asked the question, how many people have attended analyst advisor kind of meetings? This is my first since March of 2020, and I'm so thrilled to be here. I always hoped this would come back again, and it's back. And I actually think it's back with a bang. Um, how much did the pandemic really change? everything you know two answers one it changed everything but it changed nothing i think all it did was kind of what you said which is it shone a light on technologies on ways of working that was always available that the world knew existed but never really embraced it fully and found a way to get around it um, until walls got built constraints got set up and there was no other way to do it uh, and we all found a way to do it. I mean, if anyone had asked me, is there a way by which 100,000 people will switch into 1,000 cities across the globe and sit in small rooms and process transactions for a banking consumer while uh, his sister is processing a banking transaction for a competitive bank with a competitive service provider? I mean, who the hell thought that would happen. And these are banks who refuse to allow even the CEO of the provider to enter the premises until they sign 20,000 pieces of paper. So, so no, I think we learned a lot. Um, I think it told you that when you set up constraints that are unbelievable constraints, then answers are found. I remember writing soon after the pandemic, about three or four months later, saying the world should agree, which I think is never going to happen because the world agrees on nothing. But the world should agree that effective tomorrow morning, on Saturdays and Sundays, no cars will be allowed in any city across the globe. And then they'll all agree and sign, and you know things will be great. Won't happen, but can you imagine the amount of carbon footprint that will go down? But uh, I think we learned um, uh, borders don't exist, virtualization is real, cloud, I think, took off and is not coming back. I think the importance of experience took on a whole new meaning. When you're sitting at home, clunky technology is completely useless. Um, and the importance of real-time data. I mean, whoever thought that uh, toilet paper would fly off the shelf and you know, yeast would be the fastest selling thing in a grocery store. So, so how do you pick that data up in a nanosecond? And now I think the world is at a point where I think it's required, pandemic or no pandemic. Yeah, I remember we used to do audio calls, right? <laughs> Are you there? Okay. Um, Mary, you you volunteered to answer this question as well. So, what what do you what do you think really changed? Uh, I think we're still in it. Um, yeah. I think we have to recognize we are all people of privilege in this room, right? I, I'm sure we're not hungry. We are obviously have jobs, or we wouldn't be here. And the pandemic has really been described by the World Health Organization as a mass trauma and we're still in it. So many of us in here are still grieving. We may not show it because we're the walking wounded, but for every person who 
passed away, there are nine people serious, seriously grieving that. We've got social anxiety disorders, and I see it a lot with young people on our college campus. So I, I think that the, the real call is for empathy, um, whether that is for our employees, for our customers, for our bosses, because we're not, we're not really done yet. And I think it's gonna take years before we're really gonna understand the true impacts of this mass trauma. Yeah, and it's not just being stuck at home and it's just so many different things going on in the world, right? Okay. Um, so let's think a bit about a lot of these changes that are impacting us. Um, you know, inflation, geopolitics, all that sort of thing, this global assault. Um, so Nitin, is this just the way things are or is there a calmer future, you think, in store? Firstly, I think, uh, great to see everybody in person. It's a uh, heck of a lot better than uh, one inch by one inch style. It doesn't matter how big your TV screen is and you know how fancy you know your equipment at home is. But uh, I think we had a pretty big seismic shift in 2020. I, we're still reeling with the aftershocks. We're reeling with the economic aftershocks, the social aftershocks, the environmental aftershocks. It's going to take us a few years to actually wind our way out of it. So everything you talk about here, I mean, remember, even political leaders are people and they went through the same trauma we went through. So the way they're responding, reacting, you know, thinking about politics, thinking about power has changed. I think it's going to be a while before each of these things kind of settles down. And fundamentally, I'm an optimist, as you know, if you guys didn't know, I think we're actually headed in a better, to a better place because think about everything that we're dealing with right now, from inflation to the social issues. The only one answer I see for all of these things is actually better use of tech. Right. Technology is the biggest anti-inflationary measure you can think about. We've already talked about the fact that, you know, Tiger said 100,000 people working remote. Across the industry, it's a few million people. Across all the industries, it's a, it's a few hundred, hundreds of millions of people that actually don't need to travel to get to work every day. Impact that that has on carbon footprint, the impact that that has on decongestion of big cities. I mean, I can just go on and on about a list of things that will come out you know, a couple of years from now, five years from now, when we look back and say, well, that was, that was the defining turning point. So I think we will see a lot more noise, disruption, disturbance. I'd be lying if I knew I'd know everything that's going to happen in the next two years. I think we all have to kind of just deal with it, figure it out, wing it, have scenarios. You know, the fancy way of doing management is you all have five scenarios. You know, depending on which one comes out, I'll pull out the playbook. Nobody has those scenarios. We're just trying to deal with it as we go along. And I think uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating on one hand. Uh, it's unfortunate at many levels because there has been mass suffering. And I think the, the one big learning as a leader for me has been empathy over the last two years, three years, as especially as, as we started losing employees and saw the impact of that. Nobody planned to lose 24 to 42-year-olds. To you know, we lost uh, many of those last year. So I think the... the this is just the way things are, but we are never going back to, to pre-March 2020. We are in a new world. Uh, everything existed. We just realized that we have a lot, all those things that, that already existed before. And I think fundamentally, this is, uh, in a way, a golden era for, for tech. It's the, as, as our friends at NASCOM call it, the tech aid uh, that we will live through over the next few years. And, and I think we just have to be fortunate to, to be part of it. Interesting. So um, Milan, you're now in the, in the energy business. Yeah. Well, Can you, you share know, with us? Uh, first of all, uh, great to be here, Tiger. Right. As you mentioned, I was last on a panel on in March 2020 as well. <laughs> uh, so great to be here and see everybody in person. Um, I, th I think two very important points that come to my mind. One is, you know, on an overall level, anytime, anywhere has become the mantra, right? And everything that is related to anytime, anywhere, or obviously technology, IT solutions, and so on and so forth, has prospered and will probably continue to do well. Uh, but I think uh, you know the impact that it has, I believe the pandemic in two years has done 10 years of digital transformation. And I think that is a pretty severe number. Um, if you look at various industries, and since you asked me about energy, you know it, it, it was an area which you know, I've been in telecom and manufacturing and financial services and healthcare and, you know, really. Um, energy was one of the fields which was not changing that dramatically. Yeah. And I think the combination of the energy crisis, which is not just a result of the pandemic, but also, 
you know, incredible supply demand changes that have taken place in the energy sector, as well as the war in Ukraine, which has completely transformed the way the energy supply chain is. And, and as a result of it, the energy forward market is, is completely haywire. You know, it's, it's 2x of what it was two months ago. Um, so there is a lot of change, but when that change happens, the industry which does the best is technology. Because people are always looking at how do we get out of this situation in terms of having better processes, better resiliency perhaps, not the playbooks, but better resiliency, and how do we really, really react fast? And I think that is very critical as, as, as things go right now. Uh, specifically in the energy sector, I think the amount of digital transformation that's happening in the last 12 to 18 months is phenomenal. Uh, I loved your slides on customer experience and uh, employee experience. I think those are things that CEOs were not really, they were always looking at it, but it wasn't front and center of conversations. Yeah. And I think today that has changed. Um, uh, we, we, I just quote from an IDC report, which is 62% of energy retailers have actually done customer engagement software and employee engagement softwares. And 86% of them intend to do it in the next two years. Right. Now, those are not numbers that you would have seen otherwise coming through. So dramatic changes, but will continue to do so because no change happens in one go. You know, you move to the left, you kind of dramatically move back to the right before you come back to the center. So I think we are seeing a little bit of that shift, and I don't know whether we are left or right right now, but we are still moving. Yeah, um, incredible. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about the energy business later on. Then. And, and Cliff, I mean, we, we did a lot of work around AI and automation 10 years ago, and it was a very different mindset then about how it could eat into jobs and really change the whole employment dynamic, but it seems to have gone the other way in terms of we don't have enough low-income jobs being filled and there's a two-to-one vacancies to job availability in the U.S. now. I mean, what do, you, what do you think is going to happen in the next couple of years if you had to think about things a bit deeply? Yeah. Um, well, I think, uh, I think we always sort of present the pessimistic picture of, of everything. I think that the pandemic has been kind of hitting a big reset button. Things that were on track or moving a certain direction got accelerated, and that, that's across the board. Uh, geopolitics, things weren't going in a great direction with Russia. That got accelerated. Things weren't going in a great direction with China. That's been accelerated. Uh, so, you know, on the plus side, a lot of Technology has been accelerated. Uh, you know the adoption of remote work and all the technologies that go with that. That was that was on course. That was on track. It's just uh, it's been accelerated. Some of the downsides have been supply chain issues. You know, um, you know the, the the progress with some of the technology, the hardware and supply chain oriented, uh, you know. Developments have been, you know, slowed down temporarily uh, by as a result yeah. of the supply, supply chain. But look, I think uh, I think if you if you look at a ten year period, it's a pretty steady improvement. You know, it things have generally gotten better. If you do, you, would you rather live in twenty twenty or nineteen ninety in terms of? Uh, Society and you, you kind of whitewash things. You, you kind of you go back in time. You, th you think nostalgic, but things weren't that great then. You, no. you, if you were sitting on a panel in 1995, you'd be talking about the doom and gloom that's uh, that, that's on the horizon. In 2015, we're talking about, you know, um, some some economist wrote a report that said in, you know, five or ten years only 38% of the people that are working today are going to continue to work because of automation and AI. That's not true. And uh, it's created new opportunities. Jobs have shifted. There are people are doing more things. I think people are generally happier, uh, even if they don't know it, because of you know social media and how they're viewing the world today through a very polarized uh, set of information that's coming at them. Uh, but I think in general, uh, the economies are better off. People are uh, wealthier than they've ever been. Um, you know, inequality is an increasing problem. 
but the floor is higher um, than it's ever been. And, um, you know, there's fewer starving people in the world than there was 20 years ago. And, um, you know, I th so I think generally technology is good, uh, no matter where, where it comes from. The way we absorb information has been problematic. It's been polarizing. And, you know, two, three, five, ten years, we will probably see a better state of the world than we, than we do today. It's just, uh, you know, it's, it's just Stephen Pinker's book, Better Angels of Our Nature. I don't know if you've, if you've read that. No, no. He just looks at the data. He says, you know, mm -hmm. the world is safer. Uh, crime is down. Regardless of what you hear, read in social media, just look at the numbers, and uh, and it's been going that way for the last four hundred years. So, I see that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. That's got me thinking. All right. So, let's rewind back to today. What are the big issues keeping business leaders up at night? Maybe Tiger, would like to think about that a bit more. Did well, you get a good, Did you get a good night's sleep last night, Tiger? <laughs> All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> All of the above. I, I don't know if many of you may have seen just a couple of hours back or an hour back, uh, U.S. inflation numbers have come out, 8.3%. Um, this is when energy prices have actually come down. Um, so there is, there is, I mean, inflation is not going away. And the less it goes away easily, the more, you know, the Fed and the, and the European Central Bank, et cetera, have to act, and, and that act, is going to further exacerbate a bunch of things until inflation goes down and therefore unemployment goes up. Unemployment has to go up. So it's a, it's a weird situation we are in. Um, at the same time, uh, you have, you know, when, when I speak to a bunch of our clients, here's what actually I'm hearing. I'm hearing a degree of pessimism that I've not heard before. And the exact statement that one of the CFOs of a very large company made last week, at, week was, I'm extremely pessimistic about the future because of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and all the words that you had in the previous slides. Inflation, supply chain, uh, geopolitics, labor, um, etc." He said, but I cannot tell my team, I cannot tell the company, I cannot tell my board about the degree of pessimism I have because none of the data inside the company supports my pessimism. My company's financial results are the best it's ever been. My margin and my growth is the best it's ever been. And I'm unable to actually pick the signal that I see in my business and say, therefore, problem. And I hear that again and again and again. I am speaking to a large, one of the largest global beverage companies in the world, the CFO of the company just last week. And he said, uh, my biggest problem is not demand. And I said, it's not demand. He said, no. People are drinking beverages like crazy. He said, my biggest problem is uh, not supply prices for bottles and cans. I said, how can that not be? Energy prices are through the roof, therefore aluminum cans are going to be crazy priced. He said, yeah. But I'm asking my procurement team not to over-negotiate price because that's not important. I said, wow, what are you trying to ask them to do? He said, I have a plant in Ukraine. I want an alternate supplier. I have a supply chain that goes to China. I want an alternate supply chain. Mm -hmm. He said, my supply chain problem is so deep, I don't care about price. So that tells me that inflation is going to continue. So, And then at the end of all of this, I think the point that you were making, which is I think in the end it's all about do you have the right people? Do you have the right talent? Do you know how to get them into the company? Are they going to be motivated to do the work they have to? And are they going to remain here? Um, I think it's a central question for everyone in the world, all enterprises, and everyone in our industry. Um, and I love the fact that you moved from effort to performance to purpose. I think talent management is all about ultimately, I think, realizing that defining purpose and rallying people around purpose. Of course, compensation is important and rewards are important and recognition is important, but it's actually about purpose. Yeah, people wanting to come together. I think it speaks well for client relationships. Just as a, an aside, um, you know, we can't get people back to the office, but we were like double subscribed for this, this conference. Like people cannot wait to get out and see people in other companies just to say, I just wanted to talk about like, well, I want to see people, I want to network. So I think that's, that's an encouraging sign. Yeah. You know? One last statement I'll make yeah. is as a CEO, and where you were saying, do I sleep at night? I, I do sleep at night. But, <laughs> but I've shifted the time I spend on my calendar 
from uh, half my time being with clients and 25% being you know, on talent and people issues to more than half now on talent and people issues. And I've decided I'm going to do that for the next couple of years. Because I think, I love your statement saying, the winners are going to be those who know how to, that's it. The winners are talent. Talent winners are going to be market winners. Everything else is actually irrelevant. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that. Mary? I, I just want to tie some things that you've been talking about. So I'm looking at this, and I see cybersecurity, supply chain, pandemic. They're all just a part of globalization, right? right? And so globalization has created tremendous wealth and abundance, right? So that's, that's the great thing. But it also creates systemic risk. And so now what happens locally can spread globally instant, you know, pretty instantaneously, yeah, right? Insane. We saw that with the pandemic, the global financial crisis. My big worry right now as an IT person is that number one, the cybersecurity, right? So we have got to, and, and your CFO is doing the same thing, we've got to get distributed. We cannot be this interconnected in our infrastructure because that's what I'm really worried about is the next big systemic risk is that first one. Okay. So getting into these business issues, we um, shared some of these earlier, like this lag between what's important versus what a company is actually doing. I mean, Nitin, you, you, you've been so tight with a lot of your customers in the last three years in particular. What, is there a lag or is, are people getting moving faster now with important I don't decisions? think it's a lag per se. I think it's the, the issue is <clears throat> executing some of these programs that are important, urgent, and urgent actually is, is non-trivial. Right? We had a customer who knew they had a tech debt problem. They had a big, really big mainframe install base. They actually were the largest MIP consumption, MIP consumers in the world about five years ago. And for those of you who are familiar with mainframes, that's a unit of consumption of the mainframe capacity. So they initiated a program to come off the mainframe consumption and then eventually get off the mainframe. Uh, between 2010 and 2020, they tried eight times to get, exit their biggest consumption system that actually kept uh, kept them up at night. Because but, and all, all eight times, they actually failed. Because that was one of their oldest systems that was the backbone of the company that ha every transaction had to access data coming out of that system. And it just kept pulling them back. I mean, yes, they, they brought the consumption down by 75, 80% over, over the 10-year period, but they couldn't just exit that big, hairy problem. So I think it's, it's not just about the left side of the chart. The right side of the chart is dictated by the execution bottlenecks and the, yeah. the complexity that sits in there. And I think it's non-trivial because what we've done for 40, 50 years is added complexity in every iteration, right? Client server mm -hmm. was a big, internet was a big boom, but actually added a lot tons and tons of complexity to everybody's IT backbone infrastructure. Only over the last four or five years, we've actually truly started to untangle that. In the last two years, we've really put, I would say, an inordinate amount of effort on it because everybody realized that it's clunky and didn't really work that well. It was, as we call it, all banded solutions for 2020, 20, and 21. And it's unfortunate that as they started to really put some might behind these initiatives, now we have a a, a, an induced recession. I'm calling it induced because a lot of it is induced by the actions everybody took in 20 and 21. And I think it'll be interesting to see the winners from the from the others, as some of them will actually keep up with these programs, and the others will fall prey to the stock price gyrations and and cut back on them. So I think to me, the next three to four years, but especially the next 24 months, you'll actually be able to see tremendous doubling down on the initiatives by some, some enterprises. And I'm still spending 50% of the time with customers, Tiger, because I want to take some of those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the reason for that is that they need more help than they would they ever needed for the programs that they've never executed or been able to, to execute on. And now the boards and the C-suites actually driving these versus the CI driving it. So I think there's a that's the reason you see this dissonance between the left side of the chart and the right side of the chart, is because of the complexity in trying to execute some of these, these hairy programs. Yeah. It's easy to say, move everything to the cloud, because, but you know, if you move everything to the cloud as is, you move your tech debt to the cloud as well. And that's much harder to get rid of, because yeah. the only people who, make, who, who you make rich with that is, is the hyperscalers. Yeah. They love nothing more than tech debt in the cloud, because you're paying them more for consumption. Right? So I think it's a, this is a non-trivial 
phase of solving that complexity that exists in, in those systems. And that's the reason you see this. The one thing that does, that we cannot underestimate, by the way, and I think everyone dealing with it, our clients are dealing with it, I'm, I'm actually, every day I talk to customers, I see it. If it's hard for us to hire engineers, it's even harder for our customers to hire them by an order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. no, right? So I think the whole issue of employee engagement has to be completely reinvented. And I agree with Tiger that we have to continue to focus on what's the right purpose to, that we, we get. An employee value proposition is going to become center and, you know, up, up front and central. I don't have an answer. Nobody has an answer yet. We have to find an answer. How do you engage them if they don't come to the office at all? I don't think, by the way, they're coming back. Yeah. Anybody who's waiting for them to come back can just, you know, find a new job, pun intended. Uh, I don't think they're coming back. And they shouldn't. Why should they? Yeah. So, okay. sorry, long answer, but, you know, it's yeah. something that, you know, does keep me up at night. Yeah, it really does. And uh, it takes us to this whole concept of what our workplaces will be like and what skills, you know, will we need as people to be successful and, and, and now and in the future. Um, Tiger, I know you've got some views on this, but... I think many people already touched on this. Uh, you know, the central word that r raises its head completely as a leader is empathy. Um, I don't think the word was talked about much pre-2020. Uh, um, it wasn't. Uh, and today I would say, if a leader is not empathetic, you might as well forget the person being a leader. Unless they're, you know, they're just sitting in a room and inventing stuff themselves, which actually doesn't happen these days. Uh, so that empathy would be one big one. Two, uh, you have to find a way to go from the purpose to vision, mission, strategy, execution, and go up and down and communicate that to the person in the factory, to the person in the operating floor, to the head of your strategy. I mean, it's. So the ability to straddle up and down and communicate right from purpose, right to what do I do tomorrow morning, uh, becomes incredibly important. And the third one, I love your, again, the other evolution from inside the function to one office to one ecosystem. We are big believers that uh, the faster we get to the one ecosystem, the more value unlock happens. We've always been, been big believers in end-to-end -end value creation. Uh, functional value creation is the old way of doing things. You've got to break through internal organizational silos and go end-to-end -to, -end to unlock value. We now become big believers that actually you've got to go across organizations end-to-end. -end. So some of the best innovations we are seeing is when a consumer goods company, a CPG company, uh, is in the same room as one of the largest retailers, uh, is in the same room as the raw material supplier, to that consumer goods company. Solving the problem of demand forecasting that leads to supply planning, that leads to trade promotion, that leads to order fulfillment, that leads to you know, uh, the satisfaction of the consumer, which by the way changes every day. So no longer is a plan worthy of even being looked at, that's a quarterly plan. I don't think quarterly plans make any sense. Forget annual plans. I think this is about, can you wake up in the morning and call up the CPG company and the Swedish business saying, in the last five days in September, uh, or the first five days of September, your sales are up, but your margins are down because your lower margin products have been outselling your plan and your higher margin products are underselling plan. So can you guys get together and decide what you want to do today? Uh, launch a new promotion on a high value products or raise prices on a low, low price products, whatever. This is not about looking back at the end of the quarter. This is about real time. And Mary, your point on everything is connected. And people who actually are agile enough to move that way are going to see big benefits. OK, thank you. And uh, Milan, you work for a SaaS, <laughs> SaaS provider these days. <laughs> right. So what I don't understand is these, these kids want to go work for startups. But then you actually have to go into an office at, <laughs> and start up and work vertically and have fancy lunches and coffee and stuff? Or? Yeah, well, you know, I, I wish it were like that, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but but we do talk about uh, both SaaS and startups uh, because we're kind of in that environment. But I think a couple of things that you mentioned here are very pertinent. One, think of the Gen Z. The Gen Z has really started working just before the pandemic or during the pandemic. 
right? So they don't have a perspective of 15 or 20 years of working and, and then suddenly coming in. So for them, this is the norm. They have not gone and said that, okay, you know, it used to be like this, it has gone through like this, and it's going to become like this again. They have come in it and said, this is the way it works. They have also seen, you know, the Gen Xers uh, go through the life cycle of, you know, going through jobs, maybe multiple jobs, and so on and so forth. But they're actually seeing the value that, you know, startups are creating today. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about SaaS as well, but the value of that startup is what is enticing those people. And, you know, you talked a little bit about those people wanting to start their businesses. Yeah. I think they're looking at fundamentally creating value mm -hmm. or being participative in the creation of value. So somebody is creating the value and the other wants to participate in that value. Now, if you're not creating value as an organization, or at least creating the perception that you're trying to create a lot of value, it is going to be hard to retain that talent. So I think people are looking at the excitement of what that is going for. Second is, I think there is a lot of creativity, especially in the you know, Gen Z, but also you know, in the millennials. And they want to be part of something which is not repetitive, which is changing, which is rapid. Um, typically, when you create platforms, those are fundamentally different from creating a you know, a delivery model, as an example, for a particular client. But the client's may, needs may be very dramatically different, and, you know, you encompass a million things when you're trying to do that. But here, I think people are looking at trying to create something. And I think the creation aspect is something that this kind of talent really looks at much, much more, perhaps, than the talent that we used to, used to you know, sort of participating with. And I think, you know, some of the talent conversation, Tiger, you talked about 50%. I think a lot of the conversation is not just being with the talent, but actually trying to think the way the talent is thinking and is going to think in the future. I think that makes mm -hmm. quite a difference. And, and, and I'm seeing this in the SaaS world much more than I'm seeing it in the services world, that people are actually trying to think about what are the problems, what is the solution, what's a faster way of doing this? I can tell you today that for so many different things, my daughter is a senior in high school, 16 years old. She's always thinking of faster ways of doing the same thing. And you know, we said, no, this has got to be done like this, but dad, why would I want to do it like this? Why don't you do it like that, right? And you see that sense of creativity coming in that new generation, and that's still five or seven years ago, away from getting into the talent pool. So I think the, the rethinking of the talent is something that we'll all have to go through and figure out, you know, where that's going to lead us. Thank you, Milan. So Tracy, it's taken you 16 hours to get here. <laughs> <laughs> have we discussed disruption to the travel industry? Oh, oh <laughs> so you must be dying to get some things off your chest. Uh, <laughs> I don't know Tra about Tracy that. leads uh, analytics and AI for EY, right? And Connie, Connie joined us. So I'll ask you the next question. Oh, great. Uh, <laughs> We've had time to think about this, but um, you know, Milan, Milan talked about creating, you know, making people more creative and making them create things and, and following the, um, you know, the, the young talent and how they think. But how do we as bosses set the example for this environment? How do we, how do we drive these roles to be more motivating for, for people? Uh, well, I, I think when I think about what's motivating, um, particularly you know, our youngest generation. Um, I think they want a sense of purpose, and um, I, as leaders, I think if we're demonstrating that we have a sense of purpose, and that it's um, it's okay to be passionate about that purpose and drive it into what you do on an everyday basis, I think they're more apt to feel like they're free to have that purpose and and to be able to chase those um, that th that purpose and the the work that they do every day. Um, the, the other, the, the, the hybrid work environment, I think, is, is really proving to be an interesting one because there's, we're in this weird period, I think, right now where we're, we, we are, in fact, hybrid. We're not all remote and we're not all in person. And the shift and the change of how you actually operate in that environment, is, nobody's really figured it out yet, I don't think. Um, it's, it, there's the all-in-person meeting with two people remote, and those two remote people still feel very distant. They can't be part of the meeting. 
And then there's the everybody's remote, but we're trying to get people in the office and they feel the pressure to go in, but they really don't want to or need to. Um, and so there's, there's the, the, the balance, I think, of trying to figure out where and when you're going to ask people to come back into the office versus where you're really going to encourage them to, to, to live and work the way that they want to is a really tough balance that we're all going to have to figure out. And um, we have to be role models for how we can display that it's OK to do either, if that, in fact, is, is what your company culture is going to drive. Mm -hmm. um, so those, those are a couple of things that come to my mind. Okay. Do you think that economic pressures might change the game a bit? Because we've come off a pandemic bounce where most, most tech business in particular is doing great. Right? Uh, if things get tough and we're worried about our jobs and things, do you think people are going to start shifting their mindset and thinking, I've got to go and see my boss, I need to show my value? Nitin, you, you, do you think it's going to change the game? or? Uh, honest answer is no. no. I think uh, we're, these are just uh, habit-forming years. We just don't go back to, and, I, and again, keep in mind, for all of us, because of growth and turnover, Anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the workforce has been with us for less than three years. Mm -hmm. We haven't yet found the right way to engage them because they haven't actually they haven't seen anybody from the office ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a reality. I, I mean, it's stark when you back in the day, you know, you used to do these CEO town halls. I stopped doing them, by the way, for a number of good reasons because 20 percent of the people used to show up. Now even that don't show up. Because unless you do a remote one, nobody shows up. So I think the issue isn't so much, I don't think fear or force will work. Engagement and purpose will work. Right? The, I mean, we launched something called Work From Anywhere, but collaborate in the office. Uh, of course, I didn't think this through. Back then. <laughs> because, you know, they, I mean, we actually meant it. We said, you know, come back to come to the office when you need to meet the team, or need to do, and you know, a team bonding exercise, or the client is in, or you have a workshop that you need to be in there for. And they said, yeah, sure, I'll come in. Why don't you open an office in my hometown? <laughs> Not, a, I mean, I didn't think that through. <laughs> Not a bad ask, but the question is, then you have to organize your team, your delivery teams differently, because them showing up in the office with four different, you know client projects doesn't really help because you need them to be together for the project that they're working on. So I think we're still evolving through this, but I don't think fear or force is going to work. Right. And e e economy or no economy, I think they're happy to take a 20% cut if they have to for the fact that they don't have to go into the office. We've done those surveys too. Of course, no one's taking it yet because the market <laughs> is really hot. <laughs> but if push comes to shove, they would do it because I think convenience, not having to commute, not having to live by yourself, uh, over a lifestyle adjustment is probably more more uh, doable. So it feels like the bigger change is happening to the middle manager layer, where you've got to figure out how do I get the most out of the team, how do I keep these people motivated, how do I understand them better? I think the change is pretty much across the pyramid. I don't think it's just in the middle of the middle of the pyramid. I mean, of course, the middle was always frozen. We knew that. Yeah. We, we've known that for 20 years. It's the iceberg problem. Yeah. But the bigger, deeper issue with engagement really is at the, at the, at the bottom of the pyramid. Kids who came out of college in the last three years have, haven't known anything different. So this is the normal for them. Yeah, I mean, I, I was told somebody I know, they were mandated to go to the office one day a week. They everyone went into the office and the boss didn't even show up. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, I really want to jump in here yeah. because I think the one perspective I can bring as a college perspective, uh, professor you know, the University of Arkansas, we have record-breaking 30,000 students this year. And you said the magic word, Tracy, purpose, and you said the magic word, too, um, engagement. What I have really found how to get that startup culture, even in a big university, is hackathons. And if you could, even in your own organization, just think about what if we had a hackathon with cash prizes and allow you know 10 hours of their work week to this. I will guarantee you, you will see this 40% young people step up. And it has been amazing. So I teach regular classes, but when we, we just had a, a startup weekend and a lot of our students went, they worked for 48 hours straight. And I never saw them so engaged in my whole life. So that's my one idea for a takeaway. How do you create a startup environment in your larger organizations 
Think about hackathons where they're solving problems with purpose. Yeah, I like it. absolutely. So, on that note, how has our approach to technology changed and innovation changed in the, since pandemic? Uh, Mary, what do you what do you uh, what do you think is going to be core as we look over the next couple of years? There's so uh, much. You back I, to me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, yes. I mean, I know we're, we've we've talked a lot about RPA and artificial intelligence and virtual reality and artificial reality, but to me, in you know, I mentioned cybersecurity. To me, the one thing that I'm not hearing enough conversations about is verifiable credentials. So the way we do anything digital has to begin with a verifiable credential. Today, we do it with accounts and passwords. We do it with centralized databases. We do it with trusted third parties for our, our, our public key infrastructure. And that's why I'm excited about Web 3.0. So I'm hoping, and I, and I hope this afternoon, we'll have more conversations about verifiable credentials. But to me, that is something that affects every individual in this room and every single business. To me, that if we don't get that right, then I don't see how the rest can happen. Right. Yes. Right to spec for verifiable credentials. I was one of the original authors, so I'm pleased to hear it getting out into the world. Yay, Dan! Woo! Cliff, you're you're leading innovation for a big, big four. What do what do you you know? What do you see as the most influential tech in the next couple of years? Well, I think uh, I think the evolution of the internet is probably the most uh, significant, the most profound kind of uh, an internet that's more based on blockchain technologies, Web3. Um, it opens the door to a lot more possibilities around and, and you know, creation of new value for businesses, for you know, social, for education. It also begins to address some of the security, big security vulnerabilities associated with the internet that we have today. Um, I think that this is a long journey, though. This is not something that's going to be a two-year thing. This is, this is something that will kind of unfold itself over the next 10 or 20 years. Um, much like the, you know, the internet we know today kind of maybe had its origins in the early 90s. Um, you know, it really took a long time and a lot of innovations and a lot of inventions that you know, operated on the set of protocols that, that the internet today work on. Right. Those protocols still have to be developed and agreed upon for the network effect of, Met, of Web3 to really, to, to really take hold. Yeah. So that's, that's going to be really important over the next couple of years because there are many, many companies, people pouring lots of money, lots of resources into developing these standards and these protocols for Web3. So you think the stranglehold, the fang, or the mang, <laughs> Meta, Amazon, Facebook, um, it, do you think that's going to get um, loose in its grip as we Boy, see the next that's gonna be a That's going to be a war. That's going to be, a, you yeah. know, they're, they're using every resource they have to maintain some level of control um, over that. But... Uh, but there's gonna, it's, it's going to be something. It's going to be a shift. It's probably not going to be the nirvana, open, you know, totally decentralized uh, internet because there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of vested interest in maintaining some of that control. Yeah. Uh, but it is going to be a lot different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a big movement in the UK to really hit them hard with tax. Right. The government's running out of cash. And, right, right. and they're sick of these firms taking, making so much money out of their citizens' data, right? Yeah. The government, government intervention could be huge. Yeah. But there's, um, there are a lot of benefits. There are going to be a lot of winners. You look at some of the startups that are, uh, you know, backed by uh, venture and private equity and, um, you know, those companies could be the next Facebooks and the next, yeah. you know, the big next, next banks in 10 or 15 years, um, all centered around this more, more of a decentralized, more immersive internet Good. that's, uh, that's right in front of us. Fantastic. We have our Web3 metaverse conversation coming up later. Uh, and Tracy, what are, you, what are you seeing in terms of big, big tech change in the next couple of years? What, what, what's top of your mind? 
Well, all the technologies that are listed here, I think, are, are, are no-brainers in terms of continued investment. But what we don't see on here is the impact of regulation on them. And the, the landscape of regulation is, is changing so quickly that I think at least half of the, the, the technologies that are listed on here are going to have a significant impact. If you just look at what's been happening in the US, you know, the, the, the rapid expansion of data, data privacy laws are um, you know, existing in at least 17 states today. And almost every state has some type of legislation on the books that they're debating as it relates to data privacy. And then the, the regulation that is starting to roll out as it relates to artificial intelligence is happening quite rapidly. There's, you know, New York City has, has uh, um, adopted a law that um, looks at actually requiring audit, uh, bias audits when you're using artificial intelligence in hiring processes. There's, um, and the landscape of what's out there is really interesting. There's, there, it, it ranges from autonomous vehicle regulations in, in places like New York State to regulations around um, uh, preventing addiction to social media is, is one that's, that's pending in California. Um, and then there's facial recognition ones, there's voice recognition ones, they're, they're rampant. And what's going to happen is that not only are organizations going to have to weigh the ethical boundaries of how they want to use some of, some of these technologies, but they're also going to have to be looking at these the same way that they look at so many other parts of their business in terms of how they are controlling those functions, how they are monitoring those functions, how they are attesting that, the, that, that bias is managed, that explainability is present, that all of those kinds of things. And I think it's underestimated, frankly, the impact that it's going to have. Interesting. I think you're right. OK, in the interest of time, then, um, uh, each of you think of one thing um, you can do to change industry for the better based on today's conversation. If you could do one thing, what would it be? Maybe, Milan, could you start us off? Well, you know, I, I would focus on experiences. Um, I think a lot of the technologies that you listed out there, whether it's AI, ML, to get embedded in experiences, the amount of analytics you require for that, you have to have a hybrid car environment, you have to focus on cybersecurity. I think everything is changing around experiences and customer and employee experiences are critical. If you actually rethink that, um, you know, which is to some extent what we are doing, but I'm sure everybody else is too, I think that is going to be pivotal in terms of where you come out. And you know, the metaverse discussion later is going to be part of that. <laughs> but I think the experience is the underlying theme for them. Tiger, one thing we can do to change our industry for the better? I think being going against what Steve Jobs said, uh, I would say the single biggest challenge that all those earlier technologies face is adoption, is the middle adopting and changing. And I think we, we as an industry often underestimate what that change means for the people on the client side. And actually, the clients clearly underestimate it. And we don't educate them. I think we really do ourselves a disservice when we do that. We do ourselves a disservice also when we think about it only as change within a function. When you think about it as a one office, then you've got to think about the whole organization. And if you actually think about the ecosystem, a change in an organization is a change for suppliers, is a change for customers. How do you bring all of them into that change equation? I think we should lead with that agenda and um, even being blamed as, oh, you guys are consultants, I think we should have the courage to lead with that and say, I'm going to be with you and not walk away after the advice. I think that part of Steve Jobs' advice, I agree. <laughs> but I actually believe if you're not willing to step out of your box and say, I'm going to tell you what you should do yeah. and I'm going to drive that change for you, then I think we're just order takers. And I think we should get out of this box of being order takers. Yeah, people who are not looking left or right and just following the, the mundane. Interesting. Mary, one thing. I hope I don't undo everything you just said, Tiger, <laughs> because <laughs> what, uh, we you were talking about skills. And the one thing that's now appearing on lists are, are resiliency. I think you mentioned resiliency. You mentioned empathy. The other one is humility, right? And being, being you know, I think having our leaders having some humility and vulnerability, I think will do, will do make our industry better. Excellent. I've been humbled the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> Many times over. 
I agree. Uh, every day. Uh, I think it's engage, engage, engage. You have to continue the engagement process. We have to find new ways to engage minds and hearts and both employees <coughs> and customers. So I think, to me, that's the that's the one thing that we haven't done a good job of. We have to continue to find ways to do it better. Um, I would say uh, learn. Um, you know, expose yourself to different, um, you know, points of view and perspective. Um, read. Um, get get involved with uh, parts of your industry that are non-traditional. I mean, for for me, I've learned a lot getting more uh, exposure to startups and uh, and and looking at how they're beginning to address and solve problems. It's a it's a generational change. Usually yeah. they're usually they're younger, despite the Gen X uh, kind of comment, but. Um, you know, just uh, just understanding the different perspectives around how problems are being approached in in the industry. Yeah. Understanding the mindset. Yeah. It's interesting because pre-pandemic, um, when the pandemic hit, our biggest worry was the Gen Zs can't go into the office because they liked going to the office. They liked going to the office and hanging out and working together. And they're the ones now who are the hardest ones to to bring in. They like this remote environment, so it's yeah, incredible. I, I'm trying to get into that mindset and figure out how to engage them is, is the challenge. Yeah, and I, I agree. It's changed forever. Um, it doesn't mean um, offices are gone, but the way offices are laid out today don't meet the needs yeah. of you know, bringing teams together uh, you know, at scale to solve problems and interact and build those relationships. And, you know, there's there has to be better technology, better bandwidth, and so forth for the even the technologies that are really good today. You know, to Zoom and Teams and all that. Yeah. Um, it still has to get a lot better. Yeah. So Tracy, apart from completely destroying the airline industry, <laughs> re reinventing the airline industry. Reinventing, maybe. Yeah. Um, I, I think we have a absolute responsibility to um, not only engage but accelerate how we are supporting underserved communities access to technology. Mm -hmm. And that um, if, if we expect that we're going to be driving diversity into our industry, that we're going to have diverse thought, that we're going to have you know, a true representation of, of, of people that are contributing to the, the future of technology, we have to invest in, in um, in underprivileged communities, in, in underrepresented minorities, we we have we have a responsibility to do it, and um, I, that that's the one thing I think that we can do to better the industry. Fantastic! Oh, here we go. Much more fun doing this in person than on these little yeah. squares on the screen, right? Eh? <laughs> yes, you have to think a bit harder. So Milan Rao, Tiger, Mary Lasty, Nitin Rakesh, Cliff Justice, Tracy Gusher, thank you so much for making the effort to come here. I think everyone appreciates. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Good job, guys.